Well, thanks very much for um, uh, the invitation, and thanks very much for um, being here. And let's hope when I press the buttons, everything goes smoothly. And I'll also keep an eye on the time. So uh, there we go. Oh, 20 minutes. I thought I had more than that. Um, so uh, uh, I'm going to press and go straight on. Yes. Yeah, so what I'm going to try and do, I am really only going to fo uh, focus on interpersonal violence. If I remember, I will um, briefly mention suicide at the very end of this, um, uh, this talk. Um, uh, but, um, but I'm primarily going to concentrate on interpersonal violence. I'm going to be talking about specific neurocognitive systems that um, uh, uh, either mediate um, forms of violence or alternatively, when they're dysfunctional, increase the risk for forms of violence. That's what I'm the, the main goal. But before I do that, I'm going to be distinguishing between these two primary forms of interpersonal violence. That's reactive and instrumental aggression. So reactive aggression is frustration or threat-based. Best example I've ever seen of um, reactive threat-based reactive aggression is a lovely YouTube clip called Man Punches Snowman. If you want to laugh, I would suggest you look it up at some point. Basically, there, there were these pranksters who ha were dressed up in a snowman costume on the end of a pier. And when people came up to the snowman, the snowman would turn towards them. The typical response from most individuals is the primary threat response. They froze or they jumped backwards a few steps. Apart from this one particularly um, uh, large individual who had the smoke snowman uh, move towards him, and he just reached out and punched the snowman straight in the face. There was no planning going on. There was no reasoning going on. This was just threat wallop, and the snowman went down. And unfortunately, there was a small child on the other side of the snowman who got squished by the falling snowman, which is... Um, Unfortunately, one of those things that even makes you laugh a little bit more. It's a terrible, terrible moment when you, when you, uh, when you realize that you have inappropriate laughter. But, um, but uh, it is a stunning clip. If you want an example of what reactive aggression looks like in a, um, um, a regular context, it's a beautiful example. Um, uh, you also see it in frustration, people uh, not achieving their goals, um, um, smashing things in front of them. This is very different from instrumental aggression. Instrumental aggression is the person pulling a gun at you to demand your wallet. The aggression is used to achieve a goal. Completely different. Um, uh, um, um, and we see the difference in the associated disorders. A large variety of mental health conditions increase the risk for reactive aggression, from borderline personality disorder, anxiety, depression, intermittent explosive, which we mentioned briefly uh, just a few minutes ago, childhood bipolar disorder, as well as um, um, psychopathy. Very different from that is the fact that there's really only one mental health condition that's primarily linked um, uh, with an increased risk for instrumental aggression. And that's going to be psychopathy, callous, and emotional um, uh, traits. Now, one thing I really want to stress here before we go on either, uh, anymore is that both of these are normative behaviors. Reactive aggression is the ultimate response to a threat. Any of us could be made to show reactive aggression. Instrumental antisocial behavior, in some circumstances, may be the appropriate decision to make. Usually, I make this example, um, uh, you know, if I told you if you stole this device thing, you would receive $100 million. Even though some of you are pretty affluent in this room, you should all want to steal the device thing. I mean, it's, it's a huge gain. There's a few embarrassments of getting it out of the building and maybe you get caught. But the fact is, it's a huge gain. Cost-benefit analysis. If you're not thinking about stealing the device under these circumstances, there is something wrong with you. <laughs> if, on the other hand, I told you to get that $100 million, you had to shove this device into my eye, hopefully none of you are still reaching for that device. Hopefully all of you are thinking that's too much of a horrible thing to do. And the idea is what we're going to get onto is that that's really the thing that marks out somebody who's marked biological increased risk for instrumental aggression, fundamental problems in processing the distress of others. So moving on, system mediating reactive aggression, this acute threat response. One thing that's really nice is so I, I should again preface this. Uh, one of the other sort of major pushes of Tom Insel has been this idea of the R dog, the idea that we identify biological systems that cut across disorders that are become the target. So we're targeting a dysfunctional system that we can hopefully rectify with um, uh, treatment that may be shown by a whole variety of disorders. And I just showed you a whole variety of disorders at increased risk for reactive aggression um, that we can then use as our, as our, as our variable. And so they, this approach that I'm going to be pushing for you today is heavily influenced by that, that sort of goal. And what's nice is we can take 
data from animals, uh, but see whether it applies to humans to really track these things out and, of course, have much greater power for when we're trying to develop uh, novel interventions. So we have a basic threat circuitry going from the amygdala through the hypothalamus down into periaqueductal gray. We all have it in this room. Your cats, your dogs back home have it. Even the, um, you know, the mice lurking around in your, in your yard have it. It's a basic mammalian threat response. What that threat response does, what this threat system does, is it generates your response to a threat. So a threat in the distance makes you freeze. A threat that's come closer makes you try and run away. And a threat that's right on top of you, you fight the threat. And that's all governed by this really basic um, um, uh, 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 threat, um, threat circuitry, which receives um, a degree of regulation from various um, 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 uh, frontal systems. And the idea is that it's a, um, it's a highly stimulated. It's a little bit of stimulation of this neural circuit, you freeze. A little bit more stimulation, you, the, the animal moves away. A little bit more stimulation still, and the animal attacks. That's the basic, basic threat response. So the idea we can get from this with um, work on animals is that if we see individuals or groups of individuals who are heightened risk for reactive aggression, then what we should see in those individuals is a heightened responsiveness of this circuitry. They should be individuals who, especially their threat-based um, uh, reactive aggression, individuals for whom this circuitry is um, um, uh, increased in its responsiveness. And that's what we see. So this is data with patients with PTSD. Again, patients with PTSD, increased risk for reactive aggression. It's been mentioned several times already today. What we see when we show individuals with PTSD emotionally evocative images, this was threat displays, um, we see increased amygdala responses. Oh, sorry. Um, I have a bad habit of wandering about, and now I'm being told that I'm not allowed to wander. So um, uh, all, all manner of bad things may happen now that I'm not allowed to do what I like to do. So, uh, so I will attempt to stay concentrated. But anyway, we shall see what happens. So, oh, I start, I'm starting wandering already. Um, uh, so we see that with patients with PTSD. We see exactly the same thing with patients with borderline personality disorder, another disorder associated with um, high levels of uh, reactive aggression. It was mentioned just before intermittent explosive disorder. I could show you the exact same image. Again, emotionally evocative images, patients with um, um, intermittent explosive disorder also show this increased response. One of the things that's interesting about conduct disorder, one of the things that's so problematic about conduct disorder is that it's a very hodgepodge disorder. We have individuals like this group here who have conduct problems, but they don't have what's going to be, what I'm going to talk a little bit about is callous on emotional traits. They don't have the psychopathic type traits. They have increased emotional ability, increased risk for an anxiety disorder. Those individuals, even though they meet criteria for conduct problems, are showing also this increased risk for uh, increased response within the amygdala to threat based system, to threat stimuli. They're, again, ready to show that reactive aggressive response. One, a couple of things I just want to note before we end this, this, this system. We talked a lot about stress. We talked about trauma, neglect. All of those factors, both from human work and, and very directly from animal work, we know that those factors stress up this circuitry. If you're traumatized, if you're neglected, if you're under stress, this circuitry, this basic threat circuitry, is increased in its responsiveness directly by those factors. I didn't, I mean, it actually came up briefly in the question before. I didn't, I'm not going to mention today much about emotional regulation, primarily because it's not a direct factor. But obviously, if you have this problem, and you have problems of emotion regulation, then you're not going to be able to bring the circuitry down. You're going to be more likely to have a rage response or a, a reactive aggressive response in the future. And I didn't really mention any detail, but frustration also activating the circuitry. So that's the first of these systems, this system critical for mediating reactive aggression in healthy individuals as well as in patients. But obviously, if this circuitry becomes overly responsive, then we see the problem. Second system, when dysfunctional, increases the risk for instrumental aggression. And that's really going to be this empathic responsiveness that I alluded to when I told you about the example of using the um, uh, device as a weapon against my eye. Clinically, the way that this manifests most directly is in these things called callous on emotional traits, uh, manifesting in DSM-5 as low prosocial emotions. 
and basically a lack of remorse or guilt, lack of empathy, um, uh, uh, lack of attachment to significant um, other individuals. The circuitry we're talking about is really primarily the amygdala and its way of talking up into a ventral medial prefrontal cortex. So the amygdala is critical as well as being an input to that basic threat circuitry. The amygdala allows you to learn about the goodness and badness of things. If I show a fear reaction to something, you will avoid that thing in the future. If I show a sad reaction to something you've done, you're more likely than not, not going to do that action in the future. The amygdala, if it's damaged, prevents you from doing that type of learning. So the amygdala, in other words, is absolutely critical for basic socialization. Basic socialization, you know, the child hits the other child, and you say, look what you've done to the other kid. The other kid's really miserable. They're really upset. Imagine how you would feel in that circumstance. Classic um, um, socialization techniques that have a whole 30, 40 years of data showing that they are effective in increasing guilt levels and decreasing levels of antisocial behavior. The trouble is if you have dysfunction in this type of circuitry, then you cannot take advantage of socialization, the best socialization available for um, um, uh, allowing um, more appropriate behavior in the future. And what do we see? If we look at these youth with um, conduct problems and these callous on emotional traits, what we see is this profound problem in responding to this classic distress cue, the um, distress of other individuals, the fear face of other individuals, reduced amygdala responsiveness. Similarly, if we look at pain stimuli, here's somebody who's got their hands squished in a door um, versus neutral uh, um, uh, reactions with objects. Again, what we see, particularly when we're empathizing with somebody else's pain, is this marked uh, reduction in the amygdala and in other structures, the marked reduction in the amygdala's response to the pain of other individuals. And again, if we went back to that sample, uh, here we have conduct problems with um, uh, the anxiety-related issues, increased response to threat. That was the image I showed you before. This population who have these um, callous on emotional traits, a marked decrease responsiveness to the um, uh, distress cues, the, threat, uh, the fearful faces of other individuals. And in fact, there's a huge now, or relatively robust literature across labs showing problems in um, uh, the um, uh, amygdala's response to these distress cues, as well as showing profound problems in the recognition of um, these distress cues, primarily the fear of other individuals and the sadness of other individuals. It's not necessarily general, the recognition of anger, the recognition of disgust appears to be intact in this population. So again, we have this system that allows you to be responsive to the distress of other individuals, and that's so important because it allows you to learn that things that harm other individuals are bad. You associate, just because you see the distress of the other individual, you see their fear reaction, you see their pain, you see their sadness, you learn that that's not something to do. The healthy individual learns that that's not something to do, or it's a bad thing to do. Dysfunction in this circuitry means that you don't learn that. You're less bothered by actions that harm other individuals. And when I'm you know, using my marker example, if I'm trying to get people to imagine what it might be like to be an individual with callous and emotional traits, when you thought about the marker stealing example, it might be the similar to the way an individual with, well, certainly strong levels of callous and emotional traits would think of interpersonal harm, much less bothered by the whole idea of causing pain to another individual, much more able to do it. Third of these systems, systems that are responsible for reward and punishment based um, uh, uh, decision making. These systems aren't related specifically to callous on emotional traits. They seem much more of a um, uh, seen um, problems in, in, in this circuitry seems to be much more prevalent across conduct disorder, across conduct problems, irrespective of the level of um, callous on emotional traits. And you certainly see issues with respect to substance abuse populations in some of this types of processing as well. I'm only going to very briefly cover it. Again, I've taken these things out, but of course the amygdala is massively interconnected to these two other structures, ventral medial prefrontal cortex and chordate, that make up this integrated circuitry that's so important for regulating um, uh, uh, behavior. Basically, you can get it. Uh, this paradigm I'm very briefly going to describe to you is exactly the same paradigm, or almost exactly the same paradigm, that's been used with rats. 
So in other words, we get very nice translation from rodent data to human data to really increase our specificity of understanding what's going wrong in um, uh, uh, patient populations. What you have is stimuli that come up, and you can either choose to respond to those stimuli or not. If you respond to the stimuli, then you'll either get a reward or you'll get a punishment. You'll win $5 or $1, or you'll lose $5 or lose $1. So you're basically, um, uh, um, any of the stimuli can get you a reward or get you a punishment. Uh, even uh, the difference, though, is that the good stimuli, more often than not, will get you reward, and the bad stimuli, more often than not, will get you punishment. There's only four stimuli to learn about. It's a very relatively simple task, although people do struggle to, to do it. Um, uh, uh, and the thing about it is, as I said, it's directly identical to a, a rodent paradigm where the rat has to deal with smells. Some smells, uh, good smells will mean, or good smells in this context will mean if the rat responds and presses a bar when the smell is present, they will get reward. If it's not, then they will get a uh, 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 withholding of reward. So directly um, applicable to the, to the transla uh, allowing translational um, work. Now, the really, uh, there's two critical things. First off, when you're learning, you have to really be sensitive to when things have changed. If I just hand you $1,000 right there, which I'm not going to do, but if I was, if I was to hand him $1,000 right now, I know what his brain would do. His brain, he'd have a massive dopamine surge because the calculation would be what on earth, ha and, and what the brain would be trying to sort out would be, what on earth would be, I was not expecting to get $1,000. I have just now got $1,000. And therefore, I should learn very rapidly. I should see, what did I just do that would get me another $1,000? Yes, indeed. The handout might be the thing that worked. <laughs> it didn't, but it might have been the thing that worked. <laughs> That's called a prediction error, when you expect something and it doesn't happen. Uh, or you expected something, uh, you didn't expect something, it does happen, then it's really good. as positive prediction error. If, on the other hand, I got, you got used to getting $1,000 and I suddenly stopped it taking it away, you get a negative prediction error. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I, you know, I, just, I knew it was going to be trouble when you said that. Um, um, and the other thing is, when you're making a choice, you actually need to know how much this particular response is likely to get you. I mean, if you've got two choices, doing this or doing this, and you know that this one on average will win me $5 and this one on average will win me $2, it's much more cunning to press this, to go for this one. So you need to represent value and you need to do prediction error signaling. The core date is absolutely critical for prediction error signaling. And here we have a nice healthy response. As you get more unexpectedly good, you were expecting something but even better than expected. You get this increased positive prediction error in the healthy individuals. That's not being shown by the patients with um, uh, disruptive behavior disorder, conduct disorder, and a bit of ODD. Um, uh, and similarly, when you were expecting something and actually something worse happened, you get this suppression activity in the um, healthy individuals, and that's just not being seen in um, the uh, patient population. Similarly, in this region, ventral medial prefrontal cortex, critical for representing the value of um, um, objects and actions. Nice relationship. The more that you expected, the more activity that you saw in this individual if you were a healthy child, but that was, again, just not being shown in this patient population. I just showed you one exemplar study. There's now several studies from quite a few different disorders showing that conduct problem in patients with um, conduct disorder are showing very profound problems in this, uh, particularly the representation of value in ventral medial prefrontal cortex. But one thing to note here, and in, con uh, in contrast with those problems with respect to the processing of the sadness and the fear and the pain of other individuals, this is a much more pervasive problem. Patients with substance abuse have problems in this decision-making um, um, uh, architecture. Patients with ADHD have problems in this decision-making architecture. In fact, externalizing disorders generally may have problems, whether it's exactly the same form, but certainly um, um, uh, with some of this architecture that's critical for this reward and punishment based decision making. So I'm going to end up with a, a couple of conclusions. First thing, just again to summarize, these three neurocognitive systems, not disorder specific. We indeed might have a patient who came in, say a patient with schizophrenia came in, who might actually show problems with acute threat processing, uh, heightened response, or even problems relating to these issues. It's not disorder specific. There is a relationship between certain disorders, but it's not necessarily disorder-specific. 
We have an acute threat response. If that gets overly responsive, then the person is more likely to have a rage, um, uh, reactive, aggressive episode. Empathic um, uh, problems. If the individual does not, is not sensitive to the pain, the sadness, the fear of other individuals, they won't be so bothered by actions that harm other individuals. They're more capable of doing those actions. It's not to say that they will do those actions. If there's no good reason to do those actions, they won't do them. But the fact is, if there's a choice, I have no money in my pocket, that person looks like they have money in their pocket, I'll hit them to get that money, they're more able to make that choice than the individual who has um, uh, um, a greater response to the distress of other individuals. And then we have these profound problems in reward and um, punishment-based decision-making that have these more pervasive problems with ex externalizing disorders. Why I like this is because it gives us a better window into understanding some of these other factors that are around. So when we're thinking about the role of stress, trauma, and neglect, we can immediately go to animal work, which shows that what stress, trauma, and neglect do is they increase the responsiveness of that basic threat circuitry. And in fact, in human work, we can see that all of those variables are pretty well selectively associated with an increased risk for reactive aggression. So we can go from the animal data to the human data and see indeed that it all follows through quite nicely. Issues of poverty. And again, when, you're, when I talk about that decision-making process, the person who's already got $50 in the pocket is not going to be thinking about mugging somebody at the street corner necessarily because they've already got the finances they need to achieve their goals. In an individual who has less financial resources, you're much more likely to see these problems emerge um, uh, if the individual has these problems in um, empathic processing. But one thing that's particularly worthwhile noting that um, is really relatively recent data there is data from animal work showing that um, uh, individuals with impoverished diet have problems in the development of amygdala, striatum, and ventral medial prefrontal cortex. And so we can imagine that there is some degree of impact of diet and some degree of increased risk on this circuitry that we're, we're seeing. Similarly, we can look at genetics. There's obviously been a long history of work on genetics. We're definitely not wanting to go back to um, uh, um, the days when um, uh, people were talking about genes for specific crimes, I remember very bizarrely right at the beginning of my career going to a talk by a very influential member of the field who actually presented heritability data on pimping with the idea that your genes determined how good, how enthusiastic, and how vigorous a pimp you were. Definitely nothing like that. But what we can do is that we can look to see are there genes that put the person at increased risk for being more responsive in that acute threat circuitry. Are there genes that put the individual for, at risk for being less responsive in their response to another person's pain? Are there genes that, mess, that have an impact on that reward punishment circuitry? And these genes are being identified. Will that information propagate out into actually being useful with respect to individual clinical patients? That's another question. There's some data, particularly with respect to genes and increased responsiveness, the acute threat, that that may already be present. But it's, it's, uh, uh, it's not so clear for, for the other. And I'm going to mention very briefly, well, you know what? I'm not going to mention. We've got a whole session on alcohol. I won't mention alcohol. Um, uh, actually, now I can't help. Well, the interesting thing about alcohol is it seems to, I know, I'm sorry. It has, a, it has a very interesting effect in healthy individuals of reducing your response to the distress of other individuals. Um, uh, it also messes up some of that reward um, 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 uh, punishment-based decision-making. Um, it almost looks to me, at least when I look at the literature, and of course, I, you know, that, um, it looks to me like it induces some of these fundamental problems or something similar to the fundamental problems that we see in that callous unemotional group, a very unempathic, decision-making impaired individual. And now I really stopped, and I'm sorry if I ran on a little bit. And hopefully I wasn't too fast. I have a bad habit of being fast. <laughs> <laughs>